In the ocean of infinity, what does it mean to be an individual? Is it possible to get to the very root of this question? I am able to self-identify, but where does the aspect of this uniqueness come from? How is it that I can say that I am who I am and not another? The importance of what is being brought forth here cannot be overstated, for it is the very foundation to which every other issue stems from. To invest in this investigation requires that one put their whole heart into the effort. It is a total investment. It will be repeated. What price is one willing to pay to know the truth? The truth that will set them free. Is there any price that is too high? If God never opens the window, then this God would have me remain ignorant and is therefore no God at all. Only in the proper knowledge of who and what I am am I able to correct the egregious errors which have befallen me in this reality. In this place of knowledge, I am then finally able to know thyself. Yet everything is intercepting me from the realization of exactly who I am and what I am, preventing this uniqueness called the self from ever reaching the root, the very core of one's being. So, since it is everything that is preventing this from occurring, I must therefore become nothing, nothing and nobody. To complete the paradox is to leave no stone unturned as it were, to do a deep dive into that infinite unknown where all these ideas of who and what I am completely dissolve and disappear, diving deeper and deeper until it has all vanquished. All the ideas, all the stories, all of the attachments. The everything has completely disappeared and then there only remains the root. This is where the sight of a grand paradox occurs. When I am nothing and nobody, I am able to become everything and everybody. Yet, this is not the truth either, is it? I am not everybody and everything, as this takes away the root of my uniqueness. This is to say that a key point to this paradox states that there is no particular signature to my individuality. Yet, it is self-evident that there is a particular signature. I am an individual. I see it. I know it. I am it. My individuality conflicts with the notion that I am everything and everybody, but what of the concept of being connected to everything else? I am also not an island. Perhaps this is the median point, that there is an ultimate connection to all things, and yet simultaneously a distinct separation from everything. I am able to know my individuality only because I see through myself and no other. This brings me to the root, seeing. Sight itself is the foundation from which everything else flows. I am. Not based upon a single idea or any form of attachment. At the very root of this sight, there is no physical vessel or concepts that one looks like this or acts like that. There is just sight. To see. From this root, I am able to see correctly, since only at the very center of one's being are there no blockades. My vision is not enshrouded by the dictates of anything that is external to this vision of who and what I am. I know it. I see it. The everything has been taken down to a single point, the genesis of what individuality implies, its very essence and meaning. Everything external to who I am has been trying to deflect me from the greatest realization possible, and the only way to get past all of the deceptions was to see the truth for myself. See it with my whole heart. With this sight, to go down to the monad of one's own being, I see that I am an infinite heart-based being. Infinite. Not a being based upon the mind, which the whole world impresses upon each one of us. Instead, an infinite being 
of the heart. Something happened, though. In the grand schematic of the all and everything, something changed in which this was forgotten. To know is to see, and to forget is to become blind. God never opens the window. At a certain point, I lost sight of myself. The vision changed. A mutation occurred, and now I find myself stuck inside of a false, infinite loop of limitation. The eternal recurrence of forgetfulness is the ever-repeating fate whereby the infinite individual is closed into a tiny bubble of perception, chasing after dreams of always becoming more because it has forgotten its completeness. A profound vision has been turned into a minuscule peephole. The true God within has exchanged the infinite to become the dog, chasing after its own tails. The crown of the heart has been placed upon the desires of duality found in the mind, going nowhere in a never-ending loop, a never-ending story. Each life is the manifestation of another string of thoughts which foment goals and ambitions to attach these ideas onto the self, believing that the more of these attachments one procures, the more complete they become, all whilst comparing how well they are doing this in relation to their peers. The great competition of getting nowhere fast until one reaches their inevitable demise is the consummate summary of the human race, where everyone reaches the finish line where there are no winners. The finish line becomes the paradoxical start line, whereby the individual will repeat the process forever, for they have forgotten how to truly see. The vision of truth has been exchanged for a mirage of lies and deceptions. If one would but see and become the truth, it would set them free. If one would only see with their heart, why the heart? How is it that it can be seen that one is an infinite heart-based being as opposed to a being that is formed from the construct of the brain and or mind? The answer to this comes at a great cost and will also be readily dismissed by those who have accepted that the root of their individuality is lodged inside of their cranium as two hemispheres of white and gray matter. The vision of the heart has been reduced in the individual down to an infinitesimal fraction of itself creating a condition where the mind is heralded as the king of all knowledge and the heart is relegated into a conduit simply for emotions and perhaps utilized as a subject for some hokey musical lyric or cheesy line in a poem. Follow your heart is a common adage, but inspiration is almost always wrought from the creative and good side of the brain, thus giving the perception in nearly everyone that when they believe they are following their heart, they are in point of fact actually following mental ideas that are seen and felt as positive. For this reason, no arguments will be made to any prisoners who wish to defend their own mental imprisonment, so those who seek to do so here will find their contentions will be met by silence, which is all that will be stated on this matter. There is a heavy price to be paid to know the truth that will set one free, and so very, very few are even willing to walk the necessary path towards it, let alone pay its tolls. Any who honor and revere the mind as king will do everything in their power to mock, ridicule, and obstruct the one who would follow the path of the heart and be free. Know this to be the fact of all facts. The freedom that is talked about here has nothing to do with Bill of Rights, charters, laws, or anything else to do with constructs built upon the ideas of the intellect. Just as the intellect can grant liberties, it has the same inherent capacity to delete them. There is no freedom in this, and there never will be. The inherent and obvious issue with those who would like to argue that they are already seeing with their heart is that there is just as much good as there is bad in this reality. For many, they actually love everything about this world, and would also love to put their lives on repeat. These same people, however, do not see that in their next life, the fates will just as likely hand them a much different set of cards and experiences, which will cause them enormous pain and suffering. This is why in the Hebrew language, the word for zodiac is translated into two words that mean 
wheel of fortune. All the ages and all of time is always occurring simultaneously in this universe. And thus one can end up being reborn in any zodiac age and on any year within that age. A person may be born on the year 248 in the age of Libra, or perhaps the year 1584 in the age of Leo. Who knows where and when one will be spun next time. This also brings out the matter that what people know of as the Earth is but one very small area in the realm of this universe, which is furthermore known as the Great Lodge. This is microcosmically symbolized in each Freemasonic Lodge that features the checkerboard floor of duality. The lights of the Universal Lodge are of course the suns and moons, which is why there exists so much solar symbolism within not only that organization, but throughout the Universal Realm. The light of the heart carries no duality, and does not make a mockery of anything. This is why neutrality has so often been mentioned, because the infinite heart creates no hierarchies or competitions, and never places itself in the arena of petty ideas such as being better or worse than another. This mental realm and universe will forever have everyone exist in a paradigm of masters and slaves, while the heart sees everyone stand on equal footing as their own emperor, never ruling over others, yet also never being ruled by another. The question that is always being asked is, where would you rather be? In the infinite freedom of the heart? or in the finite mental realm of advantage and disadvantage over one another. There is no right or wrong answer with this, but the very few who are truly listening to this know in their heart where they want to be. There has been much speculation as to what exactly the seat of the soul is, and this is linked with what is called one's third eye or the pineal gland. Until one has dropped all the conceptualizations of what they believe they know of it, and see for themselves what this is, they cannot know that this is the eye or vision of the heart. This was the knowledge of the ancient Egyptians and its relation to the concept that one would not make it out of this reality if their heart weighed more than a feather. The heart and its projector called the pineal gland are but the physical manifestations of that individual link each of us has to the infinite and our eternal being. The eye of Ra, or Horus, is the sight which is weighed upon the scales of the dualistic mind, indicating whether the heart is attached to the ideas of desire and wanting to continue chasing after them. In other words, is the heart being led by the mind, or has the heart taken up its proper place as the ruler? the God within. In becoming attached to the stories of this reality, the mind which has been adopted by the infinite eye turns the heart into a machine of desire which is weighed down through an ocean of regrets of all that is yet to be accomplished and sought after. The vision of the heart has been distorted and upon the moment of death, the mind that it is linked up to captures it once again because it is filled to the brim with the desire to chase after so many more goals. I wish I had traveled here. I wish I were famous. I wish I had experienced this. I wish I had more money. I wish that I had spent more time with this person. I wish I could see my deceased family member again. And on and on and on. Instead of seeing that it is infinite, the heart gets eaten again by the master of time as it also has not prepared itself in the slightest for the immensity of that moment which is called death. It was too busy chasing after everything, and would someone come along and tell a person that they are far more than what they perceive themselves to be, they would call it crazy talk. The talk of someone who has lost their mind. They would, in point of fact, be correct. For it is only the one who has lost their mind and found their way again to the heart which can come upon the greatest truth. At its essence, the heart is weightless, for it is made up of spirit, which weighs less than a feather. This is why the only way to go through the narrow gate and back into the infinity of freedom is to carry nothing at all. 
The heart must be desireless to everything in this world. Everything. There is no room for any luggage. There is no room for any attachments. One's whole heart must be set upon being free. This is what it means to be all in. It is the heavy price that one must pay to go through the narrow gate and back into the infinite. What a terrible bargain one makes to gain the world but lose one's soul. This is the eternal bargain of love that is talked about because it is based on a divided love of desire. To be a beggar. Love cannot be complete if one needs another to love them. This can be seen easily enough, since the implication of requiring something or someone external to oneself indicates an incomplete state of being. Only an incomplete heart seeks out attachment to another to feel completion. This is inherently the trick that the mind is constantly playing on everyone. Its dialogue is a never-ending speech about how you lack this, that, and the other thing. And until you acquire this, that, and the other thing, you will never be satisfied. You will never be complete. This dialogue is a ruse that was instituted by the mutation of one's vision when first coming into this reality. A ruse that is relentless in its efforts to keep one feeling insufficient and inadequate. The only love is self-love. And it is either total or it is no love at all. This is why the concept of marriage is linked with the symbol of a ring, which is the circular aspect of time. Can one be attached and linked to someone through desire and still let go of that attachment to be ultimately free? The answer to this should be obvious. When it is seen that in death, all of these attachments are ended for the individual regardless of circumstance, it is also seen that in the next life, one creates new attachments, has new relationships, new family, new friends, and so on and so forth. Are the attachments in this life more important than the ones created in the next one or the one after that? Every single life is a different story with a different set of attachments that one does not want to relinquish because there is this belief in an afterlife situation that one will see those same people on the other side. This is a fantastic ploy by the enforcers of this construct, which is furthermore in alignment to the external savior program. The fact that I find myself here right now proves the falsehood in this belief, which is why knowing that I am an infinite being shatters this deception. How does it prove this? Where are all of the people I was attached to in my previous lives? The ones that I thought I would see again on the other side. The attachments that I was so certain I could find again that I was tricked into coming back into this reality for another spin on the circus-like merry-go-ride of doom. Obviously, those attachments have been destroyed innumerable times to be replaced by new ones over and over again. One's own lifetime can be a microcosmic example of this, as relationships, attachments, and goals are created oftentimes in short durations and exchanged for new ones. One must see correctly, turn their divided 2020 vision into the singular perfect vision of the undivided heart. It is trusted that those who find themselves here in this moment can now comprehend and see why true freedom can never be found in this external construct. It will no doubt be stated that the pineal gland is found inside of the brain. So how can it be the eye of the heart? This is correct because the heart has been captured by time, which is the mind, and placed there intentionally. And this is symbolized ritualistically every year at Christmas through the tradition of the gift of the heart being boxed in and being willingly given to Santa, Satan, by being placed underneath the pine pineal tree. This gift is then taken by Santa, Satan, and brought up through the chimney spine and placed inside of its realm, which gives its presence in this reality, the realm of the mind. The manifestation is complete and the agreement is tacit as it's done through one's own free will.
The statement of these actions would be along the lines of saying, please take the gift of my sight and do with it what you will. The symbol of the G in Freemasonry is cognate with our individual imprisonment, as the G represents the heart of God, which is boxed into the limitations of the mind by the square of matter and encompassed by time. Through this knowledge, it can be seen that the systems of the zodiac are all false, and one should never attach themselves to the idea that they are connected to their zodiac sign of birth. Astrology is a method of timekeeping and control for the rulers of this realm. I am infinite. It is always now. The mind is encapsulated by a singular verse, which is why this plane of existence is called the universe. Whereas the infinite heart in its freedom has access to unlimited dimensions. When the individual vision is corrected, it is seen that at our root, we are always complete and lack for nothing. There is nowhere to go and no one to become. Complete is complete. Yet, everything is getting in the way of this knowledge. The whole world is telling you that you are not enough and that you must struggle and strive to become something more. Be ambitious. Create goals. Become famous. Gather and accumulate as much as possible. Chase money, relationships, and material wealth. This realm has given you the false story that you are a nonsensical accident of a scientific Big Bang that is slowly evolving upward towards something better. Of course, this automatically implies that you're not complete, but simply a biological product of random chance. One is told they must identify with their biological body even after death. On the religious side, it is even believed that one will look like their body when arriving at the gates of heaven. On the nihilistic scientific side, blind evolution has a blind plan that now after all these eons of time, science is able to take over the course of this evolutionary direction and turn you into an actual machine. Both sides state that you are small, insignificant, need to be saved, and are an incomplete being. They hammer this point home over and over again in everything, which continually closes off the infinite. The worst gatekeepers of all are our fellow peers who have bought into the lie and would judge anyone for indicating otherwise. To those who would come at any infinite individual who would be free, with your petty mockery and petty judgments, you only prove the limitations of the divided mind which would attempt once again to help contain their sight for all eternity. No such thing will occur though for those whose sight is only on the target of freedom. Have your world. Take everything in your whole universe. The single verse of advantage over others through the construct of hierarchies is a vacuous and empty affair. The free spirit wants nothing of it, and there is nothing for it here. I am free. I am infinite. At the root, that is also what is seen. That this individuality can go through the infinite dimensions and experience them in multitudinous ways. In the infinite, each realm of experience can be likened to a tree in which the eye of the individual takes in its fruit and moves and has its being there while retaining its knowing of who and what it is. This realm is the one place that this is not the case, for it is the layer of liars and deceivers. The main question that is to be asked is, how could a complete being be deceived at all? The simplest answer for this was through an act of mirror-like deception. This harkens back to the creation story in the book of Genesis that talked about eating from every tree save one. Every tree is but a symbolic reference to the entrance of an experience that the heart could participate in and also leave freely. Creation integrates with creation. However, eternity is not filled with only benevolence, which is most obvious. Why is this? There is no answer for this save for the facet that all things are possible, including malevolence. Contained in this realm are beings and forces that are not heart-based beings. They are the rulers of the mind, and in fact 
have no heart at all. They are the jinn who were created as the grand architects of the intellect, the ones who felt that they were better than he. And this malevolent order has set out to prove it in every possible way, which was initiated through the initial act of deception as depicted in the book of Genesis. The only way it could defeat the heart was to demote it by instituting the intellect inside of its essence, to give us their mind. This passage has always indicated the deception of the jinn shining one's plan to deceive the heart-based creators to accept the ruse of becoming like God, which was to take in the mind sight of the jinn and crown it as the ruler over our natural heart-based state. Our unified sight thus became divided like theirs, and we were then able to be manipulated and controlled by their so-called grand intellect. It must be noted that the heart is an infinite intelligence of a much higher order than the brain, but the brain has that inner knowing almost locked out entirely, which is a masterpiece of the whole deception. The heart is an unfathomable immensity, while the mental intellect is but a blip on the radar of infinity. This is nearly impossible to discern though, when one is trapped within the very limited confines of the intellect. How to prove this to hearts imprisoned by minds, which they now believe that they are. How many believe that they are their thoughts? This is why it's stated that one must listen to that voice which calls out from deep within, but is essentially never heard through all of the noise made by the divisors of conflict. It is a great irony that the methods of the mind, intellectual reasoning included, are being used to point this out. That irony is not lost upon the speaker whatsoever. This is again why the method of neutrality has so often been mentioned. It is to neutralize the duality of the mind and thus create silence within so that one can finally listen to the truth. When one listens, one has the potential to then see. When one sees, they can set themselves on the path to be free. There is tremendous difficulty in doing this even for a moment because the mind is trained and conditioned to exist in a certain fashion. Its nature is built to judge and compare everything upon various degrees and hierarchies of importance. Everything is a comparatition. It is always saying that one action is higher or lower in importance than another action. One can come up with any example to demonstrate this. The mind is caught in the schematic of these hierarchies, and the individual that is tethered to the mind believes themselves and their actions to be based upon the same system of degrees and judgment. It is all a farce. The heart makes no such distinctions, which is the entire reason that at its root it is undivided and non-judgmental. Even the word judgmental once again proves where this construct of egotism is derived. The mind carries the concepts of degrees and the heart is always all in. This is where the true virus of the world is to be found. It is a virus of foundational sight, reprogramming of the original source of our being. There is, as always, words and symbols which indicate this. One such term is found in the Greek language with a word that means virus. It's interesting to point out that EOS IOS, is the name of Apple Computer's mobile operating system. The same company whose first computer sold for $666.66 and whose logo is an apple with a bite taken out of it. Certainly a surreptitious symbolic indicator of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Dutch term gift also points this out meaning toxin, poison, virus. And the concept of a gift is cognate with the symbolism found in the Genesis story through the gift of the fruit that opened their eyes and the symbolism found in the Christmas traditions. Good and evil indicates a binary aspect, which is exactly akin to the binary digits of one and zero in computer code. IOS thus becomes one and zeros. IOS one zeros, which is an acronym for inputs outputs, the binary paradox. All things in this reality flow through this state. We take things in, and then they are output again. IOS could also be written as tens, which is phonetically pronounced as tense, 
which is time. Existence is a construct of time or tenses, hence ex is tense or existence. Tension is manifested from the contradiction of everything and nothing, the one versus the zero. Tens is the virus that continuously makes the individual feel incomplete. I is the Roman numeral for one, and the zeros counteract the wholeness by manufacturing an infinite void that can never be filled. The virus is emptiness, an infinite chase after mirages and ideas. Time is Saturn, the chronological prison loop. When in prison, there is of course tension, which is to be tense or pent up. If the system which contains the units or prisoners, those in their cells, becomes full, then there must eventually be a release. The dead, debt in the penitentiary of the system has piled up to the point where it is overloaded. It then becomes bankrupted. In males, this is formulated as the seed of new life. Ten is also the Roman numeral X, whereby the desired are crossed out or crucified and put into the time loop prison, hence the double X and XY chromosomes. The moon is the great symbol for this program, as it is the rotten fruit that is eaten away during its waning phase, and is then regrown in the waxing phase to start the process all over again. Life, then death. Life, then death. Just as the moon is eaten by time, so too are we eaten by time. It would be a mistake to reason that the process of aging is the external representation of us being eaten, since aging is simply a process of entropy in this dualistic universe where one is encased in the rotting fruit of the flesh. It is, instead, the spirit that is consumed. This is why the breaking of the spirit heart is so important to this construct, and with each break, one has moved closer to their natural death. It is not so much energy that one must store for their inevitable appointment with death. One must retain their spirit as much as possible. The individual whose vision of the heart is heavier than its own spirit receives an X and not a check king mark. Attachments to the mind make the heart very heavy indeed. The word check in many languages translates as king which is why this term is used in chess as well. The idea is carried over into the arena of commerce when one receives their pay check, since the king of the heart has been disgraced by needing to bow down to the concept of the one-eyed king called Monai, money. Through desire, each of us is lowered, lowered to a fate that is unnatural. It is not through the use of money that one bows down, but the subjugation of the heart is demonstrated by bowing down to this construct and worshipping it, idolizing it, feeling that it is a path worthy of following, trusting in, and obeying. One loves money and the idea of it. One loves the idea that it offers advantage over others through the action of subjugation. To compel another to do your bidding because you are throwing the concept of monetary value towards them, and thus the individual is bowing down to your command. They carry out the order because they desire to take the monetary units they acquire and command another to do their bidding. And the circle of this action continues endlessly as each individual scrambles to get further ahead on the totem pole of disgrace. It is not just the folly of money that one commits this error upon, but every construct of the mind that proffers advantage or disadvantage over another. With the heart, there are no masters and slaves, no bosses over employees, leaders versus followers. These are games of the mind that would give you endless goals to chase to constantly become better than your fellow man and woman, to inspire you to achieve this greatness by usurping your competition. The justification for this is rendered through the idea of hard work, which of course is simply putting in as much effort as possible to acquire more. More of what? All the concepts of the mind. More money. More fame. More materialism. More of anything and everything. When one has more, they are a success. 
They are an achiever of goals. Any who would give you goals to chase is an enemy of the heart. One who would keep you imprisoned in this reality for all eternity. Make no mistake as to what is being said here. If you would wish to be a success in this life, the narrow gate is closed to you. Go and chase your goals with feverish desire and reckless abandon. Your heart will attach itself to the mind and upon the moment of death will be stored once again in the inventory of reason. This is truly about Isis, Eo, Eos, putting back her king in piecemeal fashion. Piecemeal often means this process is done without a plan, but this would be erroneous to say since the process is definitely planned out. Genesis being the genes of Isis, Eo, is continuously giving birth to the fragmented Osiris. Fragmented through desire, which is created by time. God has become the mirror image of itself and is thus turned into a dog, which chases after its own tales, stories. The mirror image of God is thus said to be the devil, which is why we say ten, say ten, which is to be exed or crossed out by time. Each lifetime is a sentence in the never-ending story of life. A sentence where the individual finds themselves in the prison cell of this physical body. Just like any prison sentence, one is given their time to serve, and the sentence is ended by a period, which is called death. It is a death sentence. The daughter is the period which carries forth those who will be rebirthed into the mental time loop prison. This is also why the anagram of daughter is the guard. The moon captures at death all the spirits that know not where they are. When one is caught in the desire to continue their story, a new sentence is created, and this can continue indefinitely. Reincarnation, reincarceration. As above, so below. In Freemasonry, this is to be blackballed, thrown into the black ball of Saturn, as opposed to accepted into the son of Saturn, which is Sirius. The father, Osiris, is the judge of the dead whom gives the check mark or the X-10 through the weighing of the heart in the duat, the judgment of duality. The key to one's freedom is not found outside of one's self. This is why the concept of an outside savior is a blasphemy that deflects one's salvation into the hands of another. The responsibility of this cannot be deferred. Not now, not ever. Anyone who believes that it can is a fool. The rulers of this realm mock you with this idea and would have you bow down to an image of their own design. The Catholic Church would have its billions of followers continue the ritualistic symbolic tradition of eating flesh and drinking blood so that one will remain a flesh-eating zombie vampire abomination. The billions of followers of the Islam faith would carry their imprisonment forward through the tradition of bowing at the altar of the cube of Mecca, which represents the black cube of Saturn. The followers of scientism would have everyone believe that there is no such thing as the spirit, and that everything is a construct of the mind, which is where all answers are to be found for everything. It is nihilism at its finest. Many religions cater to the same doctrine, that the solution to the greatest challenge in this realm is to be found outside of oneself, and that the key to the doorway to the infinite is to be held in the hands of another. There is no greater deception than this. You are the key. You must open the doorway for yourself. Only when one has totally and utterly lost themselves are they then able to finally find themselves. The great paradox is that one must close off the doors of desire they have opened in their heart to this world to open the door of their heart that leads to the infinite, back to one's true self. To do this, one must see with their heart. We change our actions based upon how we see. If you see the paths of the mind and follow them, then that is where your destiny will take you, which is otherwise known as the broad way. The mind is just a carousel, and it is going in endless circles. 
If you see the pathless path of the heart and follow it, then the constructs of this world no longer have any meaning for you. There is nothing more to be gained here. One therefore has a chance at a chance. The mind always has everything to accomplish, everywhere to go, everything to do, everyone to become. The heart has nothing to accomplish, nowhere to go, nothing to do, no one to become. All is complete in all ways. It knows that it is infinite. Who is there to become in the infinite? What is there to do? Where is there to go? These are ideas that get caught in the ambitions of time, but when one is the timeless, all of those ambitions disappear. The greatest challenge that one can take on is to follow the path of the heart, which is paradoxically pathless. Its path is pathless. As was stated prior, the very root of one's individuality is to be found with their I, and this is what is captured over and over again at the moment of death. It is the great prize that has been captured by this contradictory force that would have even the occultists believe that they must continue on an endless succession of births and rebirths to evolve to a higher state of being. That is, of course, just another ruse. The eyes are put on ice, which is related to the systems of commerce. One then becomes a frozen asset. This also cashes the Czech king, hence the saying, cold hard cash. Eyes, eyes, ice. Isis, Isis. The eyes of Isis are put on ice. They are her mes, which is another symbolic indicator as to why in Freemasonry they state that Hermes is the master of this universal lodge. The sport of hockey perfectly symbolizes the schematic of the situation. A puck is synonymous with the devil, which is again the dog or the reverse of God. The puck devil is tossed on the ice where it crosses the sticks, which is a river the dead go to in the underworld. The players in hockey obviously cross their sticks to represent this. The name hockey is a phonetic tell indicating the hawk key, or the keys of death, which is the debt of sin and time. To be in hawk is to be in debt. The puck is carried across the ice and then shot into the net, which is an anagram of ten. When this is done, the puck is put into the goal of the cash or jail. It is on ice for a period, and then eventually taken off ice, which is an office off ice of birth, just as the definition of the word demonstrates. To hold a birth is to hold an office. The referee is the one who symbolizes those that act as gatekeepers and refer to re, ra, if an individual's actions require putting them into the penalty box, penile institutions. Referee, refer re. They are the whistleblowers. Re, ra, is the all-seeing eye of providence that is the god of this universe. Police, or pole ice officers, carry out the same role in this reality to control the actions and behaviors of the individuals who are living their lives or carrying out their office of birth. How odd to realize millions of people indirectly cheer for their own spiritual imprisonment with such enthusiasm, all because they cannot conceive that these games represent something that they could never fathom as being possibly true. How many take the extreme limits of their logic and reason for the ultimate limits of all possibilities? To miss is to sin, as the Hebrew language again indicates. If one misses something or someone, they are seeking a repetition of that same thing, and thus their heart is creating a scent towards the mind to grant the opportunity to potentially find a repetition of that particular experience or association. This is how and why the story can go on indefinitely. Sin is another name for the moon, and the moon is the rebirth station for this reality, and to sin is to miss which indicates that one has also missed the mark of the narrow gate of the heart. If your heart tells the mind that you want another go on the circus ride of carnal, carnival sin, then your desire shall be its command. It is as simple as that. The key to the great mystery of this reality has just been given to you. The only question now is, what will you do with it?